So what are we really talking about when we talk about globalization? Well, whether you're from a rich country or a poor one, whether you are one of globalization's winners or one of globalization's losers, talking about globalization is often a really um, interesting way to hide behind jargon, to use what I call globalese. It's a way to say uncomfortable things while pretending to be polite. It does matter, however, in this debate, where you live. So first, let's talk a little bit about people who are opposed to globalization, even though they live in wealthy countries. In Europe, in North America, New Zealand, Australia, globalization has, for the most part, worked in these places. And in these places, debates about globalization have often been used as excuses to stir up hatred and to blame foreigners for economic and social decline, right? So I personally haven't heard Donald Trump rail against the large number of Australian backpackers who overstay their visas in America. And yet he seems deeply offended by Mexicans who cross the border illegally, right? So his anger is selective. Mr. Trump isn't proposing tariffs on Swedish goods or stirring up anger about the surge in IKEAs that are popping up across the country, right? But he's very upset about China. So he, are, uh, he hides behind an economic argument to disguise a clear racial agenda. As we all know, conversations in rich countries about globalization are often just conversations about race and multiculturalism. Dropping the globalese would make it a lot easier to have more honest conversations. Okay, so let's turn to, to talk about people who live in poor countries who are often also opposed to globalization. As someone who comes from a cash-poor but very resource-rich continent with very little global bargaining power, I'm aware of the pitfalls of certain models of economic trade. There are legitimate reasons, as you've heard, to be against globalization in these places. Africans who oppose globalization are often rejecting companies that pollute with impunity, that exploit workers, that dodge local taxes in the name of foreign direct investment, right? So conversations in poor countries about globalization are often really about hunger, inequality, and economic justice. Here too, Dropping the globalese would make it a lot easier to have more honest conversations. In other words, no matter where you live, talking about your hopes and your fears is a far better starting point than talking about this abstract thing called globalization. Are you really anti-globalization or are you simply afraid of Muslims? Are you pro-globalization or does globalization just work for you because your particular business is thriving and you can get cheap goods delivered from Karachi to Detroit, for example? So once we're clear on what we are really talking about when we talk about globalization, I think it makes it easier to do the most important thing. And what's the most important thing? The most important thing is to act to change things that we don't like. And of course, this is where things get a little tricky. People like me, who fly around the world to have debates about globalization, really like coming up with global solutions. Our instinctive response is to want to establish global standards and global norms, more of that globalese. We think globally, and we want to act globally too. But people live in real places, not in the global sphere. So this approach only makes sense if you define the problem as being globalization, as living in the glo global realm. But if you reject that word, then you might choose a different set of actions. You might ask people if their fear really isn't about black and brown people moving into their cities. You see, political battles are still fought locally, even if they have downstream global consequences and implications, right? The fights that will settle the future of things like climate change, those are taking place block by block, town by town, city by city, state by state, and country by country. We've all seen with the Paris, climate, um, Paris Agreement on Climate Change, global agreements are only as good as their weakest members. 
So if the most powerful country in the world elects somebody who's on the borderline as a climate change denier because of the state of national politics in that place, then the globe suffers. So what's the solution? It's simple. It's a two-part process. As I said before, the first thing is to ditch the term globalization because it's a smokescreen. It obscures the real issues. The second and most important thing to do is to act and to do so politically and to do so locally. Now more than ever, we have to take our hopes to the streets, to the halls of power, to the places where we live and the places we have real political influence. In the words of the late, great Audre Lorde, sometimes we are blessed with being able to choose the time and the arena and the manner of our revolution. But more usually, we must do battle where we are standing. We are living in a time in which we have no choice. I invite you all to take up the challenge to do battle where you stand. I thank you.